Hi everybody, thanks so much for being here today to listen to our research presentation. We're the Fall 2015 Stingray Research Team. I'm Belle. I'm Anat. I'm David. I'm Ricky. I'm Nick. And I'm Charlie. And along with our research advisors, Dr. Owen O'Shea and Mr. Chris Ward, we're studying the ontogenetic habitat use in spatial resource partitioning between two sympathetic species of rays. Ontogenetic refers to the life history stage or the age of these rays, and sympathetic simply refers to how animals uh, they how animals share a resource. Specifically in this study, the resource that, that resource is space. So we're studying how adult and juvenile rays share space and how two different species of stingray share space. So to give you guys a little bit of background on rays, rays are, uh, are of ancient lineage. They're over 450 million years old, and sharks and rays evolved from a common ancestor. Today, there's over 600 extant or living species of rays, and they evolved into every bioregion from the Arctic to the tropics. So why are these rays important? Well, rays have immense biological, chemical, and physical impacts on their e ecosystems. Biologically, they regulate the meiofauna and infauna, which are the invertebrates that live within the seafloor. Physically, they beat their pectoral fins and create pits, which animals use for secondary feeding and habitats. So through the same process of beating their pectoral fins, which is called biodurbation, rays allow nitrogen and oxygen to penetrate into the seafloor, which increases the nitrification zone, or the zone in which life can occur. Rays are also mesopredators, which means that they sit in the middle of the food web and provide crucial links in the trophic levels. So this means that apex predators, such as sharks, feed on them, while they feed on the animals that are at the bottom of the food web, such as those invertebrates. Because of their immense ecological importance, some scientists consider rays as a keystone species, which means that without their presence in their ecosystems, the ecosystem would, would, would collapse. So what exactly are we doing? The overall objective of this study was to interpret the ontogenetic habitat use and spatial resource partitioning of two sympatric rays, Daisyatis americana, commonly known as the southern stingray, and Himantura schmarni, commonly known as the whiptail stingray. This means that we strive to understand how juvenile and adult rays share space in order to identify potential feeding and nursing grounds. So how do we know what's a juvenile and what's an adult? So we can classify that a female ray is mature by using a study done by Grubbs et al. that shows if a ray is 750 millimeters long or longer in disc width, it can be classified as mature, and if anything less, it can be classified as immature. As for males, we look at their claspers, or their reproductive organs, which if they're calcified, we can determine as mature, and if not, we can determine as immature. In addition, we were also interested in how these two species coexisted without competition. Understanding these means allows us to have a greater idea as to how we can protect them, as their niche is considered crucial to the health of the ecosystem. On top of these two objectives, we were also quantifying basic demographic information, as well as looking into site fidelity. These are materials and methods, and this is a picture of us working up a ray. Our study was conducted in two different locations, offshore and inshore. Our offshore locations consisted of four to five schooner keys, as well as marker bar. And our inshore locations consisted of Plum Creek, Kemp's Creek, Deep Creek, Page Flat, and the Cape Luther Institute Beach. Our study was conducted on the basis of two different species. The first being the whiptail stingray, which has a circular shape, gray coloring, and a rough dorsal surface. The second species is the southern stingray, which has a diamond shape, dark coloring, and a ventral skin fold, which is shown here. And now onto our methodology. As we arrive on our offshore or inshore location, we immediately begin scanning the water for a ray, which appears as a dark diamond or circular shaped object moving through the water. Once a ray is spotted, we are deployed and immediately begin encircling the ray in the barrier net in the middle and slowly start closing in. Once the ray is herded into the barrier net, a black hand net will remove the ray from the barrier net and safely escort the ray to shore. We take several precautions while doing this, including keeping the ray far, par far away from us so we do not get stung during this process. <laughs> Once the ray is on the beach, we take a variety of morphometric measurements, but before doing so, we secure the bar with a wet t-shirt and towel and we then put gloves on to protect ourselves and the ray. We then take up to 13 morphometric measurements including disc width. We are most interested in disc width because it is the least likely measurement to change due to outside factors. 
We then tag the ray with an external spaghetti tag and an internal pit tag. We then release the ray back into the environment. Uh, these are our analytical methods. We analyzed the data using a t-test between disk widths and inshore and offshore locations, and then we represented this data using percentages. We also use percentages to help describe basic demographic data, such as abundance of male and female rays and abundance of immature and mature rays. So these are our results. The t-test we performed resulted in a p-value of less than 0 0.001, which means that the data tested was significantly correlated. This is clearly shown on this graph from the x. Oops, so sorry. On the x-axis, we have our locations inshore and offshore, and on the y-axis, we have disk width. This line represents 750 millimeters, which, as Minot referenced, was the measurement we used to describe uh, maturity in females. As you can see, more mature females are were found in offshore environment than in the inshore environment. This graph, however, does not describe ontogenetic separation for males because, as Manal also stated, you cannot classify males as mature in the same way. However, when we looked at class per calcification, we noticed there was no significant difference in where juvenile and adult male rays were in having space. We found a similar pattern in where the two species were separating space as we did with the females. As you can see here, the red dot shows abundance of southern rays. And the white dot shows abundance of whiptail rays. This large red dot here is on the schooner cave, which is an offshore location where we found a large abundance of southern rays. And most of the white dots are in creek systems or inshore locations. Only 5% of whiptail rays were found in offshore environments, and only 15% of southern rays were found in inshore environments. Another objective of this study was to collect basic demographic data. This study has been going on since January 14th of this year, and in that time, the RAID team has collected data from over 114 rays. 17% of the southern stingrays caught were male, 50% of the female southern rays caught were mature, 10% of the male whiptail rays caught were mature, and also only 10% of the female whiptail rays caught were mature. All right, so now on to our discussion. In our results, we found a significant statistical difference between the female mean disk width and the site locations, with larger disk widths being found in offshore locations. As said before, we use disk width as an indicator of sexual maturity. This is supporting our hypothesis because it shows that the two, that the two juveniles and mature rays are ontogenetically separating their cells with uh, mature rays in short. We did the same test for male rays and found that the data was not significant, um, meaning that they do not partition space the same way as females do, or it could be that they do not partition space ontogenetically. But they do partition space in some ways because of the notable difference in numbers of mature and immature rays. There were 14 mature male southern rays and only one immature, and there were one mature whiptail ray and nine immature. So this could possibly mean that the mature whiptail rays and immature southern rays are partitioning space somewhere outside of our sampling area. We also only caught one whiptail ray at an offshore location where we caught many of our southern rays. And this is this shows that the two rays are segregating themselves to avoid competition by um, occupying different habitats. So the important thing to take away from this is that through this study, we've determined that uh, southern and whiptail rays are segregating their space or uh, segregating to different habitats. and. Uh, this can inform and improve conservation efforts. In a country such as the Bahamas, where uh, land, where tourism is a very important industry, land development is a real threat to the areas that these rays occupy. So, uh, such as the inshore uh, locations, such as uh, creek beds and mangrove ecosystems, uh, those are targets for developing hotels and marinas and dredging those for boat landings. Uh, this, the data gathered by this study could inform legislation to restrict land development in those areas and uh, also aid the Bahamian government in reaching its goal of protecting 20% of its oceans by the year 2020. This would also make those protections more impactful because they're protecting such an important animal in these ecosystems. So uh, to expand on this study, uh, this study looked at how these rays are segregating space and moving to different habitats, but a further study could use satellite or acoustic tagging to look at how these rays move within those habitats and how they move specifically uh, on a day-to-day -day or hour-to-hour basis. Uh, we could also 
uh, as Nick was saying, we, we're looking at how they avoid competition. And so we can figure out how Southern and Whiptail Rays avoid competition by how they possibly partition other resources such as their diet, how they're eating different things. Uh, these are acknowledgments. We'd like to thank all, thank all of the Shark Team interns, the CEI staff, Island School faculty, all volunteers that helped us with data collection uh, and came out on the boat with us, uh, Kelly Martin for some of the photos that you saw, and Florian Fisher for some of the video content that you saw. Uh, these are our references. Do you have any questions? question was, uh, based on this study, where would uh, we recommend putting uh, an MPA or a protection or a protected area? And uh, in sh the inshore environments are more targets for the, that land development, as I was saying, but uh, specifically in the creek beds, the, the juvenile southern rays are, that is an important habitat for them. And so we would like to protect that so that those rays can keep that habitat and wouldn't have to move somewhere else and be disrupted. Thank you. The take to, once you got the uh, rain in the net and you brought it to the beach, you put your gloves out and the wet towel and the rain to do that um, experiment and then put it back out. Um, so the question was, how long does it take to take more from metrics? Um, so it takes around 10 to 15 minutes, depending if we're focused on how much we usually are. <laughs> Say more about the, the tags that you were putting on the rays. What, what, what data can be gotten from those? Uh, so the question was uh, to talk a little bit about a little bit more about the tags that we put on the ray. So we put an external spaghetti tag on and internal pit tag. The external spaghetti tag is to kind of look at for part of the larger study is to look at site fidelity, which de uh, which determines if rays you come back to the same place. In this study, we and didn't uh, specifically look at that, but uh, oftentimes when we are working on a ray, another ray will come up to the shore and be right around us. So that's just, there, although we didn't use tests to sort of uh, back that up, we do see that. We see rays together often. How come you found so few mature rays in general? I mean, they, are they way out, or in general, it's like they've got a lot of immature rays? Um, so we actually don't know why we found so many few juvenile rays. It's really interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. What was your, can you repeat your question? I thought the chart said that most of the ones you found were immature. So there were no immature females seem like they were very very rare. There big there are big differences between you know, I wouldn't yeah. expect it happen. <laughs> Some there'd be similarity if you will, between the the immature the I don't have the information to explain this uh, at the time, but I'd love to talk about it later if <laughs> you want to find me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's really interesting. Well, it is also part of our study. That's what we're trying to figure out is how they start getting themselves. Nick. Nick. Um, given your research and your research, is there a limit to the size of the Um. Well, one of our... Oh, uh, so the question was, is there a limit to this size array we can catch? So one of the largest rays we caught was a whip tail ray, and it was about seven feet wide. Uh, no, seven feet long, and that's the largest ray we have in our database. So yeah, we don't exactly know. Uh, and yeah, so there haven't been any real limitations to collecting data because uh, of our resources. That ray 
although it did barely fit in our hand net, uh, we were able to, uh, to record data for it. So it hasn't limited our sample size in any way.